Good evening. Good evening. There's a reason Niall didn't struggle when he got to high school, and that's because I think he had the third highest score in the county on the eighth grade exams. <laughs> it wasn't all just the country school. Um, I think I might be in big trouble here. I saw the hands go up. And, uh, you know, if you're doing history, one of the things you should never do is talk about history that people are there who live through it. Because <laughs> if everybody's gone who lived through the history, you can say whatever you want, but nobody's there to contradict it. So. Um, get my pages in order here. Why don't you go ahead? We're going to have a handout. Furman and Gary are going to hand out. Uh, it's just a two-page handout. I don't think we have enough for everybody, so if you could share with your neighbor, that would be helpful. Uh, and we'll be referring to that a little bit as we go through this. Um, just, just so we're clear about what I'm doing here tonight, I'm not... I'm not going to be telling a lot of stories about country schools. Uh, most of you know those stories. You lived through them, and so I don't think there's any reason for me to tell them. But what I'm talking about uh, comes out of research I've been doing on a book about uh, rural schools in Johnson County. And some of the announcements that I've seen said this is a book on Johnson and Washington County. But it's not about Washington, it's only about Johnson. So just to clarify that. The country schools in uh, Johnson County is pretty much all over eastern Iowa. Uh, were the foundation of education for over 100 years. And in Johnson County, there were about 150 rural schools from uh, the beginning, which was in the 1850s, up until 1920, when they started to fall off a bit. Uh, by 1940, it was down to 130. And by 1960, it was down to 42. At the same time, rural populations began to drop off. And if you look at your handout on the second page, There are a couple of charts there that are just data about country schools. So uh, the one on population trends, the small one at the bottom, shows you how the population in Johnson County changed from the beginning of white settlement up until 1925 when the statistics sort of are more difficult to put together. Uh, the bottom row is the total population in the county. And as you can see, that moves up pretty nicely from throughout the period. Uh, the row above it is rural population, and that goes up really fast at the beginning, but after 1875, it begins to fall. And it's fallen ever since. And rural population, I excluded Iowa City, Lone Tree, Solon, Oxford, uh, I think Coralville, maybe Shuaville, North Liberty. So tried to find just the areas where it was mainly farmers people going to the one-room schools. Uh, so rural depopulation isn't something new. It's been going on for a long, long time. On the chart above, you can see how many schools there were. And as you can see, it held pretty steady up until 1930 when it begins to drop. Uh, the next column is the number of enrolled students. And the next column is the number who attended. That's two very different numbers. Uh, for a long time, only about half the students who enrolled actually were in school on any given day. So before 1900, going to school wasn't a particularly important thing for most people. Uh, if you were a male, you might have only gone to school in the winter because in the fall and in the spring you were home working. Uh, one person said it took him 15 years to get through five grades because it took him three years to do a grade because you'd only go three months at a time. In, uh, but it's really only after about 1930 that you begin to see 
the majority of the students in school every day. And this is why the country schools lasted as long as they did to some extent, because the attendance went up even as the enrollment leveled and dropped. But more students who were enrolled went to school more often. So that kept the numbers up in the one-room schools. Now, one exception to this were the schools in Washington and Sharon Township. And if you look on your front page, there's a county map, so if you're not familiar with the geography of Johnson County, you're looking at the two townships in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, be where Sharon, Frytown, Joetown are the big cities in those townships. Um, and as nearly as I can tell, no school in Washington Township ever closed because of low enrollment, and in Sharon Township only one closed for a brief period of time because he didn't have enough students. In fact, more often the problem was overcrowding because, for example, in 1939, 38, 39, and 39, 40, Evergreen had 56 students in those two years. So you had 56 students in one room. Uh, Paul T. Gingery was a teacher, and he thought it was probably the largest school population in Iowa, and I think he might have been right for a one-room school. So if you're a teacher and you, you know, think about nightmares, I would think probably getting to school and seeing 56 students would be it. The reason these townships kept, uh, kept their schools so full, uh, there were a couple of reasons. Uh, they have large families because most of the people in these schools came from Mennonite or Amish families. And those tend to be large. And uh, the farms are much closer together because they've had smaller farms. You know, even today, if you drive out northeast of Kelowna, the farms are much closer together than they are if you go south on the Washington Prairie. Uh, so you had dense populations, a lot of students, and that kept the schools full. Same was true in northern Washington County, uh, Snake Hollow, Middleburg and Pleasant Hill, the areas right around Kelowna. Uh, dominated by Mennonite and Amish families, so again, very large schools, or large populations. <coughs> now, uh, what I want to talk about mostly is consolidation and what that was like in this area. And in Johnson County, consolidation started actually in 1920. And it started in Cosgrove. And if you're familiar with Cosgrove, you know there was a school there. And that school started in 1903 when the Catholic school started a parochial school. And it didn't close any of the one-room schools, but it pulled in students from the surrounding area. And that lasted until about 1920. Uh, when World War I ended in 1918, the farm economy took a dive because the Europe got back to producing, demand dropped, and so they ran into financial trouble at the St. Peter's School in Cosgrove, and so they made an arrangement with the state that they would turn it into a public school. So they did that, and then they brought in the surrounding one-room schools in that area, so that was the first consolidation. It was a very unique arrangement because uh, as a parochial school, they had nuns who taught there from a tumla. And they kept those teachers in the school. So the nuns continued to teach in a public school. They made a compromise that they would not wear the cross, but they wore their habits. And uh, they were teachers there until 1955. And um, I'm pretty sure that some Mennonite kids went there. I think Emory Hostelber's children went there. Uh, Emory was a minister at West Union for many years. Sylvan Yoder had, uh, I know Norm Yoder was his son, there were, I think, some others. So if they were there before 1955, they were taught by Catholic nuns in that school. In 1955, the state said, this is illegal because it's, you've got to have a separation of church and state. And so then it became a public school. But up until that time, it was sort of this hybrid of parochial and uh, private. Uh, another 
uh, example of consolidation in Johnson County was in Lincoln Township, which is north of Lone Tree. So if you look on your map and you find hills, just follow hills on to the right over the county line, and uh, you'll find Lincoln Township right on the Muscatine County line. And they, they simply didn't have enough students. Uh, by 1940, they were closing schools pretty regularly. Uh, if they didn't, you had to have a minimum number of students. That number changed over time, but usually it was six or seven students. You had to have at least that many to keep the school open. So if you drop below that, the school would close. They would send those students to neighboring schools and then pay tuition uh, to that district. But in 1948, Lincoln Township closed all their schools because the state of Iowa said, we'll pay you a certain amount per student to bust your children into Lone Tree. So that's what they did, and they just closed them. Uh, other schools would close periodically just because of low enrollments, and then they'd start back up if they got enough students. And then schools around the cities, like schools around Iowa City, uh, around Tiffin, Solon, other, you know, sort of more urban areas, not that those are big urban areas, but as they expanded, they absorbed some of the country schools right around them. Uh, the Coralville Reservoir was built in the 1950s. That took in a number of one-room schools. And uh, they widened 218 north of Lone Tree, or of uh, North Liberty, and that took out some schools. So those kind of things were going on pretty early on. But after World War II, there was a much more concerted effort from the state to close rural schools because people said these schools, they had a lot of criticisms of them. They didn't do a good job of teaching. The buildings were often in disrepair. Uh, you know, on and on and on. They had a whole list of complaints. In 1953, the state passed a law that laid out the process for consolidation. And that had been a real contentious thing before. There were lots of lawsuits, and the state said, here's how it's going to happen, and so they laid out a whole process for doing that. In 1957, the state passed the law that really ended up closing the country schools. And the law did not say that the schools had to close. The law said that every school, every elementary school, had to be attached to a district with a high school. So, you know, a country school wasn't going to build a high school, and so they had to find a place to go. And the deadline for that was July 1, 1962. Now, that gets pushed back to 1966, but, but from that point on, you knew that if you were at a country school, uh, it was going to come to an end. Now, most consolidation happened where um, there would be a town school, uh, like, and I'll use Lone Tree for an example. So Lone Tree had a school in town, a graded school, and they would uh, petition the districts around there would join them as a consolidated school. Then there would be a vote, and there were all kinds of guidelines on how these votes could be taken. And if they approved it, then they would join Lone Tree and they would become part of that school district. Uh, it all sounded really nice and easy and like this was just going to be a breeze, uh, but it wasn't. In Lone Tree, between 1953 and 58, there were five different elections or votes that were held and all of them ended up in court. They were overturned. Uh, all kinds of things were going on. And it really tore the community apart. Uh, it divided town and country because the town people always voted overwhelmingly in favor of consolidation. In the rural areas, they opposed, although even in the rural areas, you had divisions because there were some people who said, yes, we want to be in a in a consolidated district, but other people didn't. And the way the votes were set up, it was actually pretty easy to stop consolidation without having the majority of the voters. So that was a very tumultuous time. Uh, the same thing happened around Solon. They had a vote. A lot of districts voted to join, but there were some that didn't, and they fought it for uh, four or five years. Again, court cases, 
and all kinds of things going on. So the question then, one question is, of course, why did, why did people resist consolidation? Uh, a lot of foreign people said, you know, we had good schools. We got a good education there. What's wrong with what we're doing? And you could certainly find plenty of examples of people that succeeded. You know, look at Nile. <laughs> you know, look at all of you. You all made it through life with a country school education. Um, but schools are something pretty personal, and you don't want to lose control. And so when people felt like control was shifting to the cities, that's when things got pretty sticky. And you would think after the law was passed that said you have to join a district, then the opposition would have faded away, but it didn't. They continued to fight it. Oftentimes, the fight came down to which district do we want to join? Because if you were, for example, in Sharon, you could go to Iowa City, you could have come to Mid Prairie, you could have gone to Highland. So there were lots of areas that had choices, and so then it became a decision of where are we going to go, and there were fights over that. Uh, the other thing, when you read the literature on this, the people promoting consolidation, the, you know, the educational experts, uh, they often had a fairly condescending attitude toward the rural schools. That they wrote them off, that these things weren't all that important, and they were doing a poor job. Uh, rural residents also felt like they were wanted only for their tax dollars. Taxes were always a big issue with, with consolidation. And when you look at what the tax rates were, you can understand why. If you look at the rural school tax rates, this is in Johnson County, they were about half in average of what they were paying in town. So, you know, they, they first they tried to tell the people in the rural schools, well, this is going to be a lot cheaper because we can bring all these kids together in this one school. We can have, you know, classes that are all bigger classes so you don't have all the waste that you have with these little schools, uh, just all kinds of good reasons why this is going to work and it's going to be cheap. Well, I think most of the people in the rural schools looked at it and they said, no, that's not going to be cheaper because when they looked at a school in town, they saw big buildings, they saw much more staff, you had uh, more administration, you had people to maintain all of this, you had buses, people to drive the buses. It didn't take a genius to know that it was going to be more expensive, and it was. The, the consolidated schools were never cheaper than the one-room schools. So now, let's take a look at what happens in Washington and Sharon Township, because uh, the more I looked at this, the more I realized how unique these places were in the whole scope of things. How many of you remember something called Sherrington? Okay. Sherrington. Sherrington combination of Washington and Sharon. The Mid Prairie School District started on July 1 of 1957, and we'll talk about that more later. In December of 1957, six months later, there was a meeting held at the Center School, which still stands, and the Center School Board had sent a letter to people in that area extended quite a ways to other school boards inviting them to come to this meeting and there's a letter and there's some things over here on this table you can look at afterward uh, just be sure you leave them don't take them with you but there's a copy of that letter and the letter talked about there's been much talk about this school reorganization that representatives from Coralville and from Mid Prairie had been out to talk to people in this area. Uh, and the director said there's growing interest in creating a brand new district. So at this point, uh, you have all these little one-room schools out there knowing they're going to have to join somebody at some point. Uh, now everybody's start trying to lure them in and say, come be with us. So the object of the meeting, according to the letter, was to determine if there is one wish or opinion of the entire area as to the course we should take on the course of school merger. So what do we do? And it was signed by, I think it's pronounced Joni Miller. Is that right? Uh, he was the president of the Center School Board. 
The other members were Ron Hartzler, Ed Hirschberger was the secretary, and uh, Clark Brenneman was also on the board. All of these folks are gone, but some of you would remember them. And out of this meeting emerges this plan to create this district called Sherrington. And if you look on the back page, I think, of your handout, that's the map of what Sherrington would have looked like. So it takes in all of Washington and Sharon Township, uh, bits and pieces of Liberty Township to the east in the direction of hills, a little bit of Union, which is uh, would have been like where Nile grew up in that township, and a little bit of Iowa County, and the three districts in John in Washington County, Snake Hollow, Middleburg, and Pleasant Hill. So this was what these folks had in mind. And they were going to build a K through 12 school somewhere. The people on the steering committee, it's, it's an interesting group. Everett Winburn was the chair, lived down near Sharon, but the other members were Orville Kinsinger, Roy Miller, Dwayne R. Yoder, Harold Yoder, Wesley Yoder, George Yoder, Roland Yoder, <laughs> Dale Yoder, <laughs> and then you also had Reuben Miller, uh, Raymond Hostetler, Hosty, Vernon Bontrager, Ed Hirschberger, and Walter Marner. Only two of those were not Mennonite. Everybody else was Mennonite. And I think that's important, that, that that's, that's telling. So they put together this proposal. They gather a lot of data showing how many students would be in this district, what the property values were, because that was always a big issue. Will you have enough tax revenue to generate to build and operate the school? Um, and there's a lengthy hearing held in August of 1958 in Iowa City uh, in front of the boards. Each county had a school board. So Iowa County, Johnson County, and Washington County school boards were at this meeting because it involved those three counties. And there's a transcript over here of that meeting and it's it, it's run like a trial almost because he had witnesses and people testified and, and you know they made their arguments for or against and <coughs> there were two problems with Sherrington there would have been plenty of elementary students to fill a school that wouldn't have been the problem the two problems were IMS and the Amish IMS was going at this time and it had like a couple hundred students in some years and a lot of the people living in Sherrington were sending their children to IMS and so there was a question what are you going to do if we create this school and then there were the Amish who do not send their children to high school um, and it's interesting you, you kind of get a sense sometimes of how uh, people didn't always quite understand who they were dealing with because uh, there was one person who tried to argue, he said, well, you know, I think this was somebody who didn't understand the Amish very well, but I'm pretty sure we can convince them to go to high school. <laughs> we just explain to them what this is. They'll send their children to high school. <laughs> it was one of the attorneys, actually. Um, so anyway, the three boards decide on this and turn it down, say, no, it's not a viable option. Uh, they take it to the State Board of Education and they all turn it down and so that that ends. Um, I was about seven years old when all this was going on. I didn't understand what, what it was but I remember my dad was all worked up about this and, and he was on this committee and my oldest brother remembered going to this hearing with him. It ran until about like midnight and he said it was a really hot night and everybody was tired. Uh, but my dad was not somebody to get involved in politics or things like this at all. But he was very involved in this. Uh, and that's true with a lot of people on that committee. They were not people I think of as activists. But in this case, they were. So the question then is, why did these people want to do this? Uh, because there's going to be a lot of work, they're going to take, it's going to take a bunch of money to do it. I think there are a lot of reasons. I think the fact that there were so many Mennonites and Amish living in this area had a lot to do with it. 
they didn't want their children going to school in Iowa City or Kelowna or Wellman. Uh, this is only 10 years or so after World War II. And if you know anything about World War II in this area, if you were Mennonite or Amish, going into Kelowna or Wellman was not a pleasant experience. So there was a lot of hesitation about mixing uh, in those communities. And there was also just the fear, I think, of you would lose your children because they're going to go into a town school, they're not going to be close, they're not going to be, you know, part of the country, part of the community. So we're going to lose them. And it, it was very interesting, there was a statement in the sort of the mission statement about this that said, it is the hope that no activities, either extracurricular or required classes, will meet after or before the planned schedule of the buses. So they didn't want their children going to school before 8 o'clock, and they didn't want them coming home after 4 o'clock because <coughs> they needed them to do the work on the farm. And that's one of the things they didn't, they really worried about with the consolidated school. Pretty soon you have athletics, you have all of these things going on after school. The kids aren't home where they need to be, they're in school, you know, doing all these other things. So that's the end of Sherrington, sort of. Now, as I said, Mid Prairie started on July 1 of 1957. And that's important because that really plays into what happens in this area that I just described. Mid Prairie was a very unusual district in many respects because it included three different towns. Most consolidated districts grew up around one town. And Mid Prairie had Wellman, Kelowna, and Westchester. And initially, each of these towns continued to operate their K through 12 schools when they first consolidated. And there's a map, I think it's on the second page, of a proposed district for Mid Prairie. This map was put together uh, in 19, July of 1956, so a year before Mid Prairie was formed. This was a map that was a preliminary map uh, that showed what they expected the district to look like. <clears throat> and there are some areas that are colored in. Those areas were not part of the district when it formed in 1957. They did not join the Mid Prairie District, but the hope was that they would join over the next few years. And <clears throat> The green areas eventually did become part of Mid Prairie, but the blue areas and the red areas did not. And this created a real dilemma for Mid Prairie because if you look at that map, what they were expecting was a lot of area to come in on the Washington Prairie. So Prairie Flower, all down in that area, were those areas were going to come into the Mid Prairie District. And they had taken an option on some land in Summit School District, and you can see that on the map. Uh, it's north of, in that Westchester area. They had taken an option on 40 acres of land in that district to build a high school. In 1959, January, February of 1959, that area in red, voted to join the Washington School District. So this changed the dynamic pretty quickly. And the areas in blue went to Kyoto. So you can see you now have a really oddly shaped district. It's no longer kind of rectangular. It's sort of a, you know, the area from Welm to Cologne and then this little snake that goes down to Westchester. And once these districts chose to join Kyoto and Washington, that ends your opportunity for any expansion. And it meant then that the site of the high school was going to be right on the edge of the district, really not centrally located at all. And this creates huge problems in the Mid Prairie District because now there's a big fight. What are we going to do about the high school? And there are lawsuits and, uh, you know, a lot of tension between the towns because Westchester wanted to keep it where they planned 
uh, Kelowna did not. And every time there was a vote, Kelowna would vote overwhelmingly against it, and Wellman and Westchester would vote for it. And because they had passed a big bond issue right before the decision by the Washington, by those districts to go to Washington and Kyoto. So Mid Prairie has a problem now, and their only option to expand is north. North and somewhat east maybe, but not much. So suddenly these areas to the north are gonna feel a lot of pressure because if, if Mid Prairie doesn't get these areas, they're not gonna have a very big district and they're not gonna be a viable district very long. So now, this starts things going in Washington Township. And in August of 1961, the residents of Washington Township filed a petition with the Johnson County Superintendent asking for a vote to create a district in Washington Township, create their own district. And uh, again, the names of the people on the steering committee are insightful, I think. Walter Marner was the chair. Uh, Vernon Bontrager was on it. Raymond Holstetter, Holstie. Don Showalter, Leroy Rock, Eldon Swartz and Druber, Martin Bowler, Willard Brenneman, Floyd Yoder, and Maynard H. So Holstie was the only non Mennonite. Three weeks later, the, the superintendent said, yes, you can vote. Three weeks, weeks later, they voted 298 in favor, 16 opposed. So a huge majority. <coughs> so now they have the uh, permission to create this district in Washington Township, just, just that township. So now the, the next step is to build a building. So, so they begin meeting to plan for a building. And most of the meetings were held in Hostie's garage in Friday. Uh, some were in Walter Marner's home, but uh, you know it was just it was just a bunch of local people getting together to plan a building. And a year later in August, they were ready with a bond issue to build this school. And it was very interesting when they got ready for this vote members of the committee went around and visited everybody in that township. So they went to them and talked to them personally and explained what they were going to do. And the bond issue was for $225,000. And in August of 62, uh, they voted on this 345 yes and again 16 no. There must have been 16 people in that town. <laughs> That's a 95% yes vote on a bond issue. That's unbelievable. You never see that on a school bond issue. And it says something about the support in that community uh, for the school. And when I started looking at this, what doesn't make sense is the people in Washington Township could have simply closed their schools and sent their children probably to Mid Prairie, because that's where they were probably going to end up. They could have just closed the schools, not spent any money, just let their children be absorbed into Mid Prairie, which is what most people did, uh, and that would have been it. So my question was, why did they choose to spend all this money? Because they knew in 1961 and 2 that the, they were eventually going to have to go into a district with a high school because they were. They were not going to build a high school. They were just going to build an elementary school. So they did this knowing full well that they were not going to be able to keep that district for very long. And the, the vote on this bond issue was going to increase their taxes by at least 20%. So they were going to, they were going to spend some money to do this. And one year later, uh, the school was open. And in the fall of 63, uh, they had students. And it was very interesting. Um, I was out at the water shop one day and they said I should go talk to the people who built the school because they had worked for somebody in Muscatine 
So I tracked this guy down, uh, Carl Reichardt. His father, Elmer Reichardt Construction, built the school. Elmer was no longer living, but Carl was. And uh, he, was a, he was between his senior year in high school and his first year in college, the year they were building this. So he spent his summer working on that job site and talked about how much he learned to appreciate the Amish because they ended up eating in some Amish homes because there were Amish guys working on this. They hired some local people to work. And, and he said something which I, I think is true. I don't think, you know, it seems odd he would have made this up. He said when they got paid, because when you're doing something like that, you get paid every, you know, so many weeks or whatever, that sometimes the person who paid them would come in and pay in cash. And not just $100, but you're talking several thousand dollars in cash, which, you know, I had to wonder what's going on. And, <laughs> Well, either they were embezzling money from somewhere else. <laughs> the only thing I could come up with was they were paying their taxes in cash. But, but I don't know, but it just seemed interesting that they were paying cash uh, to build this school. So the question is then, why did they do this? Why did they spend all this money when they wouldn't have had to? Um, and I think there were a couple of reasons that appear in some of the literature. And there were two statements in particular. One is, it says, by building a centrally located school for grade children, it will be possible for the children to get their entire grade school education without leaving Washington Township. So by doing this, their children would stay in the township. They weren't going to have to go to Kelowna or Wellman. And the next statement, it says, having a single building for all the children would give reasonable assurance to the people of Washington Township that their children would attend grade school in Washington Township even after the district was part of a high school district. So their thinking was, if we build this school, wherever we go, whether it's Mid Prairie, which was the most likely, although there were some people talking Williamsburg or Iowa City, wherever we go, they're going to have to keep this school open. They're not going to close a brand new school. And that's exactly what happened. You know, they ran that school for 50 years as a community school. <laughs> now, the question is, why were they able to do this and others weren't? Because when they were fighting around Lone Tree, they talked there about building a school out in the country, just like, you know, a, an elementary school. And I think there are a number of reasons. First of all, going back to what I said about the enrollment in these schools, they always had a lot of students. So they were always full. Uh, they never worried about not having enough students. And you get a little bit of an idea of this. In 1940, at the eighth grade graduation, Washington Township had 34 students who graduated. Most townships had four or five students. So that gives you an idea of how many students were going through these schools. The other thing, of course, I think is the fact that you had Amish and Mennonites and their, their desire to have their own school and be somewhat insulated. Um, the, the town schools were too much of a threat to them. Uh, another thing that worked very smoothly was many of the teachers who had been teaching in those one-room schools moved right into Washington Township and kept teaching there. So very familiar, everybody knew each other. Uh, it was a very comfortable <coughs> transition. And I don't know, you know, I have a theory, I can't prove it, but I, I think that the, in many ways, the greater the distance between you and the school, the physical distance, the more miles, the more miles there are, the less the attachment to the school. Um, not always true, I don't think, but I think it often is. So Washington Township really operated in many ways kind of like a country school. They had picnics at the end of the year. Some of you went there, so you would have known all of this. Um, I think it felt like a just a big country school to a lot of the people who went there. 
and but it's also a contradiction in a way because one of the criticisms that people had of the rural school districts was that they wouldn't pay any they wouldn't pay taxes they weren't willing to spend money to operate their schools well in washington township they spent a lot of money to operate a school that they wouldn't have had to so i think it kind of contradicts that idea so by 1966, the country schools closed. Uh, the one exception in terms of public schools, because the Amish continued to operate their schools, the one exception of the public schools is Evergreen. Mid Prairie kept that school open for the next 10 years. Uh, and I think for a couple of reasons. One was Mid Prairie was full. They didn't really have space. So keeping these kids out in the country school helped them out. Uh, L. Glenn Gingery was the teacher there. He'd been teaching for a long time, and he was willing to stay there, and they, I think they felt they had a good arrangement there. Uh, and I think there was hope that this would keep the Amish involved, that they might go to the school and then be more willing to transfer into town. So what are the lessons you learn from a rural school? Um, rural schools weren't perfect. You know, they, they had problems too. Not every teacher was a good teacher. Um, and when you were teaching eight grades, you had to be able to teach everything across the age line. So you had to teach music, you had to teach art, you had to teach math, you had to teach science, you had to teach it to first graders, you had to teach it to eighth graders. Not everybody could do that. Uh, the other thing about a country school was because they were so small, the district was four miles square two miles by two miles. If you had a couple of families in that district who weren't terribly interested in education, and maybe they owned a lot of the land, and they didn't want to spend much money, they could easily influence how the school operated. So if they said, you know, we, we want to keep our taxes down, hire anybody we want, don't put any money in the school, that was probably what happened. On the other hand, though, if you had a couple of families who really wanted to put money into education, they could do that. Uh, the interesting thing, too, I think about Washington Township was there might be a lesson there that the way you accomplish things isn't always through lawsuits. Sometimes you just need to band together and do what you need to do, because that's what they did. <coughs> Another couple things about the country schools, um, students were very sheltered. You know, if you went to a country school, you know your world was sort of right there. Uh, your exposure was a field trip going to Iowa City and going through the P&G plant. You know, that was sort of the big thing. Uh, or maybe going to the next school and playing the game of softball. Uh, that, was, that was your world. Uh, which can be both good and bad. It's not always bad. Uh, but I think there were also a lot of positives. Uh, in a country school, everyone participated. So when you had a Christmas program, which of course were huge events, everybody had a part. When you played ball, everybody played ball. It didn't matter if you were a boy or a girl, it didn't matter if you were good or bad, you played ball because they needed you. They had tremendous community support, uh, and that shows up, I think, in the resistance to consolidation these people really fought to keep their schools even when they knew it was kind of a lost cause. Um, I think a country school, you gained a lot of confidence because you were given responsibility. So if you were a seventh or eighth grader, you might be asked to help somebody in the first or second grade. And again, I can't prove anything, but I've often wondered if there wasn't a lot of benefit to mixing those ages. The, it kept uh, it kept the older students more involved. You didn't separate yourself out. It gave younger students a role model. I still remember Marlon Logan was my hero. <laughs> he was in the eighth grade, and I believed he could just do about anything. Um, you know, I wouldn't have had that in a school where everybody was separated by grade. Uh, another thing about the country schools, I, I think it was a good thing. 
there was tremendous peer pressure to behave <laughs> because you knew if you misbehaved at school, it wasn't going to be a secret because everybody you went to school with was a neighbor or a relative. And so the word was going to get out pretty quickly. Uh, and when you talk to people who went to country schools, they always say they never had discipline problems. That's not quite true because uh, they also talk about teachers using rulers and things like that on them. But, uh, you know, I've wondered, did that environment <coughs> put a lid on a lot of behavior that, you know, would have been pretty destructive. And it's really hard to compare because uh, the country schools had things about them that you don't have in a bigger school, even when everybody's the same. And just the dynamics are very different. Um, but I, I don't think they were a terrible experience for most people, and I think uh, people could get a good education in a country school. Not everybody did, but I think a lot of people did. So that's pretty much all I have. If do you want to do questions? Sure. Or, okay. So if you have any questions, John's got a mic here. Um, uh, spin out a little bit the uh, center school, center high school, and the Sharon High School. You know how long? Do you know how long they were open and why they closed? <coughs> I don't know the exact dates. They were both closed by, I think, 1942 and 43. And I think Sharon went for 20 years at least. Center, I don't think, went quite that long. Sharon closed in 1944, spring of 1944.